So, hey, uh, we're closing out our series on uh, the most interesting man in the world. So inside your program is an outline. I want to encourage you to take it out and uh, follow along today as we, as we walk through um, today's, uh, today's lesson. Now, we, we kind of had a little play on the most interesting man in the world, the Dos Equis guy. And uh, you guys, if you've been here, we had a picture of Jonathan. Jonathan made his money in a car wash business. Later became an uh, in in the movies and commercials, and then he became a pitch man for Dos Equis. I don't drink, but I love the commercials because I think they're witty, they're funny, the statements are absolutely hilarious. And so I have a couple of them as we wrap up the series. All right, and, and so here here's here's a couple of his statements. He says, he says, as he walks by, the roses smell him. He once won the Tour de France. Everyone know that? That's the bicycle thing that, that Armstrong wrote because he, uh, wrote one because he's on drugs. That guy, you know? So he once won the Tour de France, but was disqualified because he rode a unicycle. You know what a unicycle is? Remember that? And then here's one I can relate to, and you just raise your hand if you've ever been there. He bowls overhand. You ever do that? I did in high school. They never invited me back, all right? And then, and then this one here <clears throat> is the one that we're going to play on, and that's where he says, stay thirsty, my friends. And we're going to talk about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, all right? So inside your outline is a, a, a program is an outline, and let's walk through today as we look at never thirst, which is opposite of what Jonathan would say. And so let's just kind of give you a little background of what's taking place, and we're going to be in John chapter 4, and so if you have your Bibles, you could flip over to John chapter 4. So... Here's what's going to take place. Jesus, who is a Jew, is going to talk to a Samaritan woman. So if you know the story, hang out with me because we're going to put a little twist on it and have a little fun with it, all right? And so this is going to be just something that's really different. First of all, a Jew would never talk to a Samaritan, and certainly a Jew would never be in an area where the Samaritans lived. It would be something that would be absolutely not necessary. So what happened is this. In about uh, about 720 B.C., there was a king, and the king conquered this area of, of, of Israel, and they, he started importing people and exporting people. And so there were Jews, and they were pure-blooded Jews. And so you know the Old Testament, the Jews were not to intermarry with anybody. It was part of what God desired for them to do. And, and so what the king did is he started exporting Jews out of this region, and he started importing Gentiles into the region. And a Samaritan is a person who is intermarried. So there's, they have part Jewish blood and part Gentile blood. Well, the pure Jews, uh, who were pure uh, Jews, did not not like them at all. They, they, in fact, they, they despised them. And so they were not into the intermarriage thing, and so they were totally against it. And so if you were a Jew and you had to get from point A to point B and Samaria was in the middle, you would literally go all the way around because you wouldn't want to go through that part of town, if you will, right? And so they would go all around. Well, in this case, Jesus doesn't go around. He actually goes through. And he's going to meet a woman, and this woman has kind of a little shady past. We don't know a lot about her, but we know that she had five husbands, and she was living with a guy who wasn't her, mar- her husband. And so we don't know much of that, but there's a little bit that gives us a little snippet about who she is and how society would look at her. So now remember that when Jesus would speak, oftentimes he would bring clarity to who God is. So in the Old Testament, we say Christ is concealed, meaning that there is pictures of Christ in the Old Testament, but it's veiled, it's hard to understand. And in the New Testament, we say Christ is revealed, the veil comes off and we see, clear, we see clearly who Jesus is. Well, in the Jews believe that when the Messiah would come, he would bring clarity to who God is. And so Jesus would walk into the lives of people and oftentimes his statements like, I am the vine, you are the branches, you guys looked at that last week with Larry, and, and then I am the resurrection of life on Easter, and to Today, never thirst. And what he would do is he would bring clarity to who God is, what our value is, and how he longs to have a relationship with us. And in those moments, if we embrace it, if we hold on to it, and we allow it to kind of sneak into our life or or come into our life, penetrate into our, our soul, it radically transforms our life. And so this woman is going to have an encounter with Jesus. It's like a moment where all of a sudden she's kind of like doing life and he's going to intercept her life and he is going to have this amazing conversation with her. Number one in your outline. The very top of your outline 
it says this, the woman was about to have a divine appointment with, her, with the Savior of the world. And she has no idea, right? Now, what the cool thing is, is that we can experience the same thing in our life on a regular basis, and maybe today is gonna be the day for you. And that is where you're walking through life and you think you have a need in your life and you think it's, I just need to do whatever it is. And all of a sudden, as you walk through life, all of a sudden, God kind of intervenes into your life. And you have that moment with him where all of a sudden he reveals to you deep what's in your soul or what you need to adjust in your life. And this is gonna be the experience. Now, at this part of the, of, the, of the story, she does not realize that. She just thinks that she needs to go to the well to get water, okay? Now, a little background about her. She's going by herself, okay? Which tells us a lot about her culture and what they viewed of her. Now, we know five husbands and she's living with a guy. It's not her, not, not her husband. So we know she has a little bit of a, a, a confusing past. But the idea that no one would go with her is really troubling. That says of volumes because women would typically go get water. That was their responsibility to get water for the family each day. They would either go early in the morning or late at night. Their, their weather is similar to ours. So let's think about June, July, August. Probably no one wakes up and says, you know what, the best time to do yard work is around 12 o'clock right? You, you either want to do it at 7 in the morning or 6 in the morning, right? Or 7 p.m. at night. But you definitely don't want to go out when it's 102 degrees out. And so this is what they would do. They would go, the ladies would go early in the morning or late at night. She goes all by herself at high noon, which tells us this, that the ladies weren't interested in embracing her. And women would go to get the water for social reasons, right? So you remember when you were in high school, this is maybe just me, but remember when you used to go on double dates and triple dates? Remember all that, guys? You got, got that, right? And all of a sudden, all the ladies at the table had to go to the bathroom at the same time. You, me you remember that? It's like they got the memo that their bladder's full and they all have to get up at the same time, right? And of course, the guys... Oh, oh, you don't even know, want me to go there. So anyway, we're just kind of scratching our head, not sure, right? So they all go, well, this is the situation with them. They're all going to go get water together. But in this case, she goes by herself, which tells us a lot about how society looked at her. Now, if you take a step further back, the, the idea that if you were a tax collector, that was like bad. If you were a Samaritan, that was really bad. And if you were a Samaritan woman, that was the worst, right? In the eyes of a Jew, that was the worst possible scenario. And this is her, right? This is her. John chapter 4, verse 3. Y'all ready? All right. <clears throat> so when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. And verse 4, now he, what's the word? He had to go through Samaria. Well, he didn't have to go there. But remember, as the scripture is written, it's not written in real time, right? So as Jesus is doing stuff, something, they're not pinning it. They're going to write it later. So, so John is going to write his gospel later after Christ. And as the Spirit of God works in him and, and works in, in, his, in his life to write down the scriptures, John remembers this situation and he places in there just that little phrase that he had to, meaning this, that it was a divine appointment from God, that Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. Jesus had to meet the woman at the well who was a Samaritan, and he had to intersect her life at that moment, and that's why he went through Samaria, not because he couldn't get there any other way, it's because he had to intercept her life, and again, I think oftentimes in our life, God does that with us as well, that God comes in and meets us in that moment, verse, verse five. So he came to, uh, to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his, uh, to the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, verse six. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, meaning 12 o'clock noon, okay? So here's how it would unfold. The disciples were leaving because they're going to go get some food. Jesus is sitting at the well, just kind of kicking back and relaxing. 
Here comes a crowd as this woman begins to walk toward the well. She's got her big container to fill it up, and she's walking, and all of a sudden she sees a group of guys coming toward her. Now this is odd because it's high noon. No one wants to go out when it's 105. And as he gets closer to, as she gets closer to the group, she recognizes they're Jews. Why are they here? Why are they interested in this area? No Jew is in Samaria. That's just not going to be acceptable. So as they pass by, there isn't going to be any like good morning, good night, drop dead, nothing. This, this is going to be one of those times where your head is going to be down and you're going to walk right past them. You, you ever had those experiences? Maybe you're at the, like the grocery store or at a place where there's a person that you don't like, right? Are you with me, right? You guys do it to me every Sunday, <laughs> right? Every Sunday I'm in the lobby and you're like, right? And I even go, hey, and you're like, oh, you're here? You didn't go out the back door, right? So, so you know those encounters where like, I hope I don't see this person or that person doesn't look at me. Yeah, you ever done that? Come on, be honest. Sure, we all have. Well, that's the situation here right? So she passes the guys, and she's thinking, okay, I made it. And then she gets closer to the well, and there's someone sitting down, leaning against the well. She's thinking, this is strange. And she's going to walk up, and she's going to see Jesus, who's a Jew. And she's going to be beside herself, because she's not going to know, what in the world am I going to do in this situation, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the situation it's in? Verse 7. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus, what did he do? Said to her, right? So he initiates the conversation, right? Now this is gonna be totally out of her comfort zone. So he initiates the conversation and he asked her, will you give me something to drink? And just kind of underline that because we read through it in the gospel and we don't think it's really that big of a deal, but it is a huge deal in the story about this woman right? He asked her, hey, will you give me a drink? And verse 8 says, the disciples had gone on to town to buy some food. So the guys just go ahead and they, and they move forward, okay? Now, now, when he says, will you give me a drink, that there's something in this statement that is incredibly powerful about our relationship with Christ and how he pursues us and how he views who we are, okay? So what he's saying is this, even though society Looks, you, looks at you as an outcast. You have five marriages and you're living with a guy. You can't even get any of the ladies to go with you to get well water. But I am willing, I am willing to drink out of the same jar that your lips touched. Okay, now let's be real. I'm all about being real in church. You ready? Let's imagine that you're in San Francisco. You have friends come in from out of, out of state. And you decide to go take them through, through, through San Francisco and show them a great time. And you go all over and you're hiking and you're Pier 39 and you're walking to Ghirardelli Square. I mean, you're walking all over. And all of a sudden you realize all the shops are closed, there's no drinking fountains, and you are completely dehydrated. But there's a guy in a doorway sitting on a cardboard mat. He has a bottle of water in front of him. You're dying of thirst. Are you going to walk up to him and say, excuse me, sir, may I have a drink of your water? Come on, be honest. This church is about being honest. No, you'll die of dehydration, won't you? In, in fact, be, be real. Some of you won't even drink after your spouse. Right? Yeah. And none of you will drink after your preschoolers. Right? Because that's where you get the, the peanut butter jelly sandwich with the milk. Right? So you won't even do that. Right? And Jesus is saying to her, you know what? I'll drink out of the jar that you drink out of. Society wants to kick you to the curb, but I'm going to speak value into your life because I'm not interested about where your feet has been, but I'm concerned about where your feet is going. Right? And I'm going to see that your life is going to be radically transformed. And so as he walks, as he, as he speaks to her, he speaks, number two in your outline, Jesus' statement to her reveals how he views her. That she has purpose, she has meaning, she is valuable, even though society may not necessarily feel that way. <clears throat> Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate 
with the Samaritans, right? That was common knowledge. Everyone, everyone knew that. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and circle the bold stuff, <clears throat> if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Right now, now the part about the bold part about the gift of God is he's, is he saying this? It doesn't matter what your background is, and this gift that I'm giving you isn't because you're really smart, and you're in the right family, and you got money, and you got a right kind of job, right? And you're not excluded from it because of your past. This gift is from God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. But every one of us have value in the sight of God, regardless of what our past looks like. And so he says to her, this is a gift from God. And then he goes on and he says, this is living water. She doesn't have any idea what it is. She's thinking she's just going to go and get a bucket of water and take it home for her family. She has no idea exactly what it is that he's, that, that, that he's talking about. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with uh, and the well is deep. You don't got a bucket with a rope on it, right? Where can I get this living water? So she's confused. She knows something is really cool going to happen. But she's not sure what it is. Verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Remember, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the three rock stars, right? And so she's comparing that to them. It's like, so are you like above those guys, right? And then she goes on. He says, who gave us the well and drank from it, Jacob, and, and as did his sons and his flocks and his herds, right? That's why it's named Jacob's well, right? So are you like greater than him? Are you greater than Abraham? Are you greater than Isaac? Are you greater? Do you fit into one of those in the group? Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, right? You all agree with that? You ever drink from the fountain one time and then you're done? No, how many drank water this morning before you came to church? All right, so, all right, some of you need to hydrate. Your skin looks much better when you're hydrated, right? And it also gives you clarity of mind. Do you, you realize that, right? Some of you need to drink way more water, <laughs> right? <laughs> you agree with that? Yeah, tur turn to your neighbor and say, do you drink water? Yeah, they drink water, all right. And then my guess is, is when you go home today, those of you who didn't drink water, you're gonna drink water, right? Yeah, because it never ends, right? Our body is always craving to be hydrated uh, in our life. And so, so she, she has a little bit of a you know, question about what's taking place. Um, what verse are we in? Verse 14. But, you, but, uh, but whatever, uh, whoever drinks the water that I will give him will what? So Jonathan on Doseki says, be thirsty, my friend. Jesus says, if you drink from my well, you'll never thirst again. And we'll see what that means. Indeed, the water I give him will become uh, in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. Now, she would have known what eternal life kind of looked like, but not a clear picture. In fact, John would clarify it a few chapters later, which is in your outline. John chapter 17, he clarifies what eternal life is. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, right? And so, so eternal life starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, because the gap between a holy God and a sinful man is Jesus Christ. Right? That's the cross, the, the, the cross of the picture uh, uh, divide, or conquering the, the chasm between a holy God and a sinful man. Right? And so John later would clarify it. Number three, the third thing is this. Jesus is offering her a gift that would quench the thirst that she is not even aware of having. Right? And this is to me what is so cool about when we have times in our life where all of a sudden God steps in and intersects our life and we think that we need, right? And all of a sudden God steps in and he meets the need that we're not even aware of, right? And oftentimes, like if I think back in my days when I did youth ministry a thousand years ago, the, the secret of, we used to say the secret of a growing youth ministry, cute girls and handsome boys. You wanna know why? Simple, right? All the handsome guys want cute girls. And all the cute girls want handsome guys. And so often you would see that where they would go there because some girl was there or some guy was there, but then they would meet Jesus. 
And they went there for the relationship with that person, but they leave with a relationship with the living God, right? And so often in our life, that's exactly what happens. We go thinking we need, but, but, but God intersects in our life, and all of a sudden that need is met, and we weren't even aware that we had that need in our life as he steps in. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. Chapter, or verse, uh, verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and, keep, uh, and have to keep coming back to draw water out. That's her view, that he's going to quench her thirst for physical water forever, right? That's how she's looking at it. Now, in verse 16 is an interesting thing, <clears throat> and it happens in our life all the time as well. And when we have these encounters, at times we kind of wonder where it comes from. But Jesus turns to her because he's going to make her aware of a need that she has in her life that she's not even aware of having. And he's going to say to her in verse 16, he told her, go and call your husband and come back. Right? And when you read that, you just kind of gloss over it really quick. But this is a situation where Jesus is going to bring her in contact with what her need is really in her life. Because how many husbands does she have? Five. Five. And she's living with someone, right? That, that there, was a, there was a thirst in her life that she felt that could only be quenched by relationships. And Jesus is going to take this moment in her life, and he's going to ask what looks to be a question from kind of like, where in the world is that coming from? And he's going to bring her in contact with a need that she really has in her life that she's trying to fill. And so he's gonna ask her, hey, go get your husband, bring him in, let's hang out, let's have some fun. In verse 17, she says, I have no husband, right? She replied. And now, now imagine this, imagine this. She had five and she's living with a guy. So there's obviously painful experiences. You know, I've worked with hundreds of couples. I, regardless of how well the divorce went, there's always hurt and pain in any relationship that breaks up, right? And when someone comes in and says, hey, you know, and they, and they ask you the question, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off a scab, right? No one wants to go back there. Everyone wants to move on, right? That's something in my past. I just want to be over with it. Right? You definitely don't want someone coming in and kind of dumping salt on the wound, right? And I, and I shared in the first service, my experiences when, when I was in junior high, my older brother was killed in a car accident. And about six months after he was uh, he killed, this is how my defense mechanism was, it was that I didn't want anyone coming up to me asking me, hey, how's Billy doing, right? Perhaps who didn't know, or I'm sorry that your brother has passed away. My thing is, I just wanted to kind of move on. That was my way of dealing with it, right? I didn't want anyone. And so I was like hiding from people, especially people who knew he and I were brothers because I didn't want that. And I'm sure that this is exactly where this woman is. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, hey, go get your husband. And it's probably one of these things like, do we have to go there? So she says, I have no husband, and Jesus re replied. Jesus said, you are right when you said, I have no husband. Verse 18, in fact, you have had five husbands, and the man uh, you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And all of a sudden, right, we have this kind of, looks like kind of a weird statement in the midst. It's Jesus bringing her in touch with really what's going on with her inner soul which is number four. Jesus puts her in touch with her thirst. She's thirsting for something, and she thinks her way of doing it for her is relationships. That somehow we just keep trying because the last guy wasn't that good, but this one's even better, right? And so we're gonna fill that need, right? And when we fill that need, life is gonna be good once again. And Jesus brings her in touch that there's something in you that's missing and you're trying to fill it this way, which is in your, just below it, it says, <clears throat> this is his way of saying that life has left you thirsty and your attempt to quench that thirst has not worked. And so you just keep on trying. One more, right? One more, one more, and that's it. somehow it's going to fulfill that. 
verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. He knows her background. He's a Jew. He shouldn't know it. And then in verse 20 is deflection. This is where times in your life where someone gets too close to really what's going on in your heart and you want to push back, right? And so Jesus is getting way too close to what's really going on in her life. And so she wants to change the subject, right? She, she wants to kind of like point and go, look at that, in hopes that he goes, oh, yeah, and forgets. And so here's what she says, verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, meaning the Samaritans, but you Jews claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem, right? And it's all about deflecting because what Jesus is saying is way too close to home. And we do the same thing. We do the exact same thing. We'll have moments where God intersects our life and all of a sudden he's getting way too close to what's going on and really what we need. And so what do we do? We push back. And oftentimes how we push back is by not allowing that truth to sink into our life and make the adjustments that we need to make or what I call surrendering in that moment to him. And so we push back and yeah, but, and what about, and I'm not near as bad and all this other stuff, and we deflect, right? Well, she's not gonna deflect. She's gonna, she's gonna allow, even though she's confused, she's gonna allow this moment to penetrate into, into her life and into her soul. Number five in your outline. Jesus' conversation becomes way too personal and painful for her. He is getting way too close to home. Verse 25. The woman said, Now uh, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming. Right? And remember, this is the view that the, that the Samaritans and the Jews had, that when Jesus would come, the Messiah would come, that he was going to bring clarity to everything that was confusing from the Old Testament. And so he, uh, she goes on and she says, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. But in the meantime, are those Birkenstock sandals you got on? Those are really cool, right? And the tie-dye shirt, I mean, that is so 70s, that is really awesome right? And, she, and he, she wants to deflect Jesus so that she can get her water and she can go on home. Verse 26, then Jesus declared, I, uh, I who speak to you am he. Now imagine what she's feeling at this moment. She said, when Christ shows up, he's going to clear everything. And he looks at her and he says, I'm it. I'm the one, right? I'm the one. And then verse 27, I love the disciples. You want to know why I love the disciples? Because they're all a bunch of knuckleheads, right? And which, which for me helps me out because I'm a knucklehead, all right? Now, it doesn't mean I like Harleys, but it means I'm a knucklehead, all right? And so any knuckleheads in the house? Yeah, a few of you. Some of you, if you hang out with some of us who just raise their hand, you'll become a knucklehead. So the disciples, uh, they returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But they were, they were smart enough not to ask, right? What do you want? Why are you talking to her? Fortunately, they didn't say that. Verse 28, key part of the text. Then leaving her water jar. Now, what is, why is that significant? Because she went there thinking she needed to get water for her physical need. And it's a symbol that Jesus met a deeper need in her life. And the one thing that she went to go get symbolizes leaving it behind and walking away, right? And oftentimes in our life too, it's, it happens where we think we need, Jesus intersects our life, we forget about what that need was because he feels the greater need in our life. Right? And, and to me, those are moments where it's amazing that the creator of this universe cares so deeply about us individually that he would set up an appointment with you that give you that moment where you're like, this is crazy. But will we embrace it or will we deflect? Right? That is the big issue. Will we embrace it and leave the water jar, if you will, 
and in order to brace that moment where we, our life begins, uh, is radically changed. So she leaves her water. The woman goes back to town and she tells the people, verse 29, come and see a man who told me everything that, I've di- uh, that I did. And he could, could this be the Christ? Is it possible? Now, we know a few verses later in verse 39 that apparently her facial expression, her passion, her eyes, I mean, something said he's the Messiah. Because look in verse 39, it says this, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, right? And so there was this large movement of Samaritans who came to Christ as Messiah and King, right? And, and to me, this is, this is amazing. So let's take a deep breath. You ready? Ready? So let me ask you a question. This is sand. How much sand do you need in your life to quench your thirst? Just ask a question. Maybe you need one relationship. Will that do? There's still something missing. Well, you need another one. I mean, duh. So would another one do? Besides, he's way better, she's way better than the last. I mean, it's still something missing come on now you got to go for three what's wrong with that so let's just try another one of those besides that house i mean it's small besides you live next to the bukerts by the way that's me and they're they're wacky right they do weird things you don't want to live there you need to move somewhere else you need to buy by pastor eric schumacher because he's wonderful so let's just get a new one of those too right how about the car I mean, don't you need one of those? I mean, that car's old. It's like a 2017, right? You got to get a new one. 2020s are coming out pretty quick. Do you want one of those? I know, big deal. $700 car payments, please. What's the big deal, right? So let me ask you, how much sand does it take to quench your thirst? And every one of us know in here There's no amount of sand that will ever quench your thirst. But what do we do? We do that, don't we? Because every single one of us, whether you're a believer or not, there are voids in our life that only Jesus can fill. And in those moments, there's that need in our life that we think that we need, whatever it is. And so we go right to the container and we just dump a little more sand into our our cup. And we think that's it. And then we get it. And then we step back and we go, I mean, that was, so obviously I need two, right? I mean, one isn't enough and it's an old model. What's the big deal, right? And yet every single one of us knows that there there is absolutely never enough sand that you can drink that would ever quench your thirst. And yet we do it. And this is the story behind the woman at the well. Her way of filling her container with sand was relationships. And Jesus intersects her life to tell her, there's none. You can't have enough guys to fulfill that need. And he brings her in contact with that. And she leaves her container and walks away. And here's what I've learned. With believers and unbelievers, and I'll speak to believers first, When we have those needs in our life, and every single one, regardless of whether you have a seminary degree or you're a brand new creation, uh, uh, a brand new Christian, you're gonna have those needs in our life. And this has been my experience, my own life, and then talking to hundreds of other folks. When that need comes into our life, we're gonna either embrace Jesus to fulfill that need, or we're gonna go to our sand container to fill that need. But we're all going to have those needs that are constantly coming up and revealing themselves in our life. And what I've learned is this. The reason why I look over to my sand container is because when Jesus intersects my life, I'm refusing to surrender in that moment to him. And I'm going to say, well, yeah, God, but... And I'm going to do exactly the same thing the woman at the well said. Hey, you Samaritans, us Samaritans worship over here. You Jews worship over here. Nice sandals, nice tie-dye, good hanging out with you. I got to go. But in moments where he comes into our life and he reveals that need, when we surrender to him, 
And surrender is simply this. God, I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to arm wrestle with you. I'm not going to make a deal with you. I'm just going to simply say yes to your way and to your wishes. And I'm going to surrender to that moment. And when we do, he comes in and he moves our container and he fills that need. But when we push back and we say, yeah, but, and all this other stuff, you know what happens? We get the container and we dump more into our life. And we, every single one of us knows the more sand you have in the container, it doesn't make your life more, uh, more, more enjoyable. It complicates and it compounds the troubles in your life. And we do the very thing that the woman does. Let's just take, take, take this as an example. Let, let's just say, and I've never heard of this ever happening in anybody's life, but let's just say that in the last few years you've made some poor financial choices in your life. And you're digging yourself out of it. And your commitment was in 2019 was this. Man, I'm going to get out of debt and I'm going to pay off the credit cards and I'm not going to spend. I'm going to rely on Christ because that was a message I preached on, on, on the first of the year. You remember that way back when that, remember 2019? Remember that 100, 100 years ago? Yeah, you forgot of that already, right? And so what ends up happening? So all of a sudden, you see the person drive up in a cool whatever it is, Right? And then all of a sudden, you have a hunger because you're missing something spiritually in your life. And you look over at that car, bike, boat, house, clothes, shoes, whatever it is. And you know what you say? If I just had that, my life would be better. And then God will place in your life a person that will bring honesty to you. And you'll say, hey, I was at the car lot and I was looking for, and I mean, it's got a 100,000 mile warranty on it. It's got get to get 59 miles of the gallon. I mean, it is like awesome. And the insurance is only like eight times higher than the current car I got. It's not like nine times. And what's the big deal? 700 bucks a house car payment's not that big. I mean, I need it. And you sit in it and you go, oh, that new car smell. I mean, woohoo, right? Isn't rationalization and justification like the worst thing that you could ever do when it comes to decision making, right? You can rationalize and justify anything. You believe that, right? Ask your neighbor what they've rationalized and justified, right? And we could be here all year, right? So, so here's what happens. Someone comes into your life and you're like, hey man, didn't you make a commitment the first of the year that you're gonna get out of debt and you do the same thing the woman did to Jesus? Yeah, but... Right? And if I get it, I mean, I'll save like 50 bucks a month in gas. Yeah, but it's going to cost you 700. I know, but so, so that makes it only 650. That's a screaming deal. Right? And you go through all that stuff and you got nice sandals and hey, look at my nails and look at my hair and look at this. I mean, you go through all that stuff because you're deflecting and you're pushing back versus just taking a moment where you pause and you say, this is a divine intervention by the creator of this earth, to visit my life, to radically change me. And I can push back or I can simply surrender and say, God, thank you for your visit. And I'm gonna make the adjustments that you desire for me to make. And I'm gonna depend on you and trust you in a greater way. And when we do that, we experience what the woman at the well said, where Jesus said, if you take this, you will never thirst again. And here's our choice. You can either do what Jonathan says, stay thirsty, my friend. Or you can do what Jesus said, which is when you drink from my well, you will never thirst again. And every single one of us, believers and unbelievers, have needs in our heart that only Christ can fulfill. It's the only way. You are created for a relationship with the living God, and that happens in John 17 through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we pause and just recognize that there are things in our life that we try to fill with containers of sand, and we know here as we sit here <laughs> that it never works. And Lord, my prayer is for me personally, and Lord, for every person who's sitting in here, that we will depend on you and trust in you to meet those needs that only you can meet, that we'll surrender in that moment, that we'll embrace that moment, 
and our life will be radically changed. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never entered into a personal relationship with Christ. And as we close out uh, this message today, I want to give you that opportunity to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. We just do a little ABC. It's not a formula. It's just kind of way we track it. And A is admit that we're sinners, that we've all missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on the cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today and you've never invited Christ to be your Lord and Savior, as I say this prayer, just silently repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I have missed the mark. And I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And today, I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, on the back of the communication card that Sammy uh, said, there's a box there that says becoming a Christ follower. If you prayed that prayer with me, check the box, drop it in the offering bag. Also, it's a time to give back. God loves a cheerful giver, so we appreciate all of you who have been and giving both uh, online and as well physically here in the, uh, in the church. If you have prayer or desired prayer after the service is over, over this exit sign, there'll be some folks that will meet you. If you have some needs in your life that you uh, would like to be pr- uh, prayed over or prayed about, we'd love to do that. And now you're gonna watch a short video during the offertory. You're gonna see the best looking guy in the house. So here we go. This coming Sunday, we start a great series on awesome relationships. God wants our relationships to be far more than fair, average, good, or even great. He wants our relationships to be awesome. Awesome relationships cause the world to stand up and take notice because they are different from many of the dysfunctional relationships all around us. Healthy relationships are not automatic or easy they are worth striving for. In this series, we're going to discover the tools necessary to build amazing relationships. So on May 19th, we're gonna start the series and we're gonna look at the foundational block that's necessary for awesome relationships. And it will be called, It Starts With Wisdom. That will be week one. May 26th, we're gonna tackle the issue of conflict. And we're gonna look at the secret sauce of overcoming conflict in relationships. June 2nd, we're going to look at God's standard for family relationships. June 19th is a big one, and we're going to look at actions speak louder than words in relationships. And we're going to close out the series on June 16th as we look at how to move relationships from unhealthy to healthy. Every day we encounter different kinds of people. Some are delightful, some are difficult. You may have some who are inspiring and others who are irritating. Some are fascinating and you love to be around them. Others are intimidating and you steer clear of them. Some of life's biggest emotional drains have to do with bad relationships. And so this series is about how to transform your relationships. I pray that I will see you next Sunday. God bless you. We're so glad that you came to church today. Have a happy Mother's Day, and we hope to see you back next Sunday. God bless you, and you guys have a wonderful week.